So, hello, and welcome to Sis Share Stories. Uh, this is a stream I decided to do because I thought it'd be... It's one of those things that I always find interesting to listen to people's TTRPG stories, uh, their characters, like what their character has done, and I love talking about the things that my characters get up to when I play games, and I was like, there's a lot of stuff on Twitch, but there's no real like, hey, would you like to come and talk about your character and what your character did and like the fun things that happened to them? And I was like, yeah, maybe we should do that, see how that goes. See if people are interested in doing that kind of thing. Uh, so I'm going to be recording this as well. Uh, probably for being put up on the YouTubes. We'll see. Um, as you can see, uh, in the middle is the logo type thing. It's not really a logo. It's just to let people get a decent idea jumping into the stream what's going on. So you've got like... SYS, a little campsite fire, uh, share your stories, and then uh, I found this image somewhere. I don't know how, why, who, what, or where, but it was just an image of a sister of battle reading like a heretical book or something really interestedly. And I was like, that's very appropriate because of me and 40k and everything. Uh, then you just got like up, up the top right, you just have a little in of some kind, which is just there. I don't know why. Uh, and then I decided in this one, I, it's not something I often do, but I just decided to have chat there. Because I thought, you know, you never know. Maybe someone wants to talk about their own story, like drop down something very quickly or anything like that. So yeah. Can we name the Sister of Battle Fook? Sure, why not? So that's Fook. Reading Heresy for Dummies. Uh, are we going to hear about Old Man Henderson and how he won Call of Cthulhu? Uh, that is one of the stories I do have. Uh... So, so yeah, we can, we can... We can... We can read through that. It's a pretty long one. Uh, so that can be like closer to the middle of the show Where it's like yeah, we'll uh, we'll read through old man Henderson uh, and how he won uh... <laughs> It is a great one however um... Oh, so uh, if you would like to tell your story if you'd like to tell you know, it's a story about a character or about a game that you played that had like a funny happening or you know anything along those lines. If you were a GM and your and your players did something interesting, it's literally just TTRPG stories in general. Tell me them. Uh, there are two ways to do it. If you would like to tell the story yourself, if you'd like to come on and chat in the chat, uh, join the waiting room in um, in my Discord. Uh, I'm sure someone will do exclamation mark discord so you can find it. Uh, and I will pull you in for that. Um, <laughs> someone already jumped in there. Okay. Uh, if you don't want to be on microphone, which I understand some people are a little bit off about that or a little bit, you know. Uh, there is now in the blabber section of my discord, submit your stories. Um... It's just a little text bit, text channel there, where it's just below with the RP and such. You can throw in your stories, and I'll read them out in my terrible reading things. Um, so if you're looking to read, if you're looking to tell a story, I will get to you. I'm gonna do a couple of very short stories very quickly. Uh, because they're funny and interesting and very, very classics. I feel like everyone should know them. So, because they're so short, I'll do that first. Then I'll pull you in. We'll have a chat about your stories. And we'll kind of go from there. So. 
I want to see. I want to see the way chat uh, got a story about my best character to date and his shenanigans. I'm happy to hear it. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to it very shortly. Where do we go post our stories? Here or Discord? Uh, in Discord, there is a channel called Submit Your Stories. S Y S Submit Your Stories. Uh, you can just chuck your stories in there, and I will read them. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. So, <clears throat> this first story is something that's it's a story that everyone should know if they have any interest in TTRPGs, even if you don't, because it's a story of someone that's, uh, you know. But anyway, it's called Eric and the Dread Gazebo. So, I'll just read out the story because it is one of, it is it is one of my favorites and it it's a it's a great little D and D story. Uh, whenever I hear someone tell me that they're worried they don't know how to role play or that they're worried that they're playing their character wrong, I smile and think of Eric and the Dread Gazebo because no matter how badly you think you're role playing your character. At least you didn't waste a plus three arrow on a white gazebo. I've reposted the story in its original entirety below that future generations may forever know the story. So this is the tale of Eric and the Dread Gazebo. In the early 70s, Ed Whitchurch ran his game and one of the participants was Eric Sorensen. Eric plays something like a computer. When he games, he method methodically considers each possibility before choosing his preferred option. If given time, he will invariably pick the optimal solution. It has been known to take weeks. He is otherwise, in all respects, a superior gamer. Eric was playing a neutral paladin in Ed's game. He was on some lord's lands when the following exchange occurred. Uh, so there are two people here, one's called Ed, one's called Eric. I'll say their names as they switch their who's saying what. Ed, you see a well-groomed garden. In the middle on a hill, you see a gazebo. A Eric, a gazebo? What color is it? It's white, Eric. Eric, how far away is it? I'm trying to decide if that's the best way. To... I'll try it without the names because it, it may get a little bit... Uh... It may get a little bit uh, iffy, so let, let's... Uh... So this is an exchange between the GM and player, Ed and Eric. So we'll start from the beginning, see how this goes. Ed, you see a well-groomed garden. In the middle, on a small hill, you see a gazebo. Eric, a gazebo? What color is it? Pause. It's white, Eric. How far away is it? About 50 yards. How big is it? Pause. It's about 30 foot across, 15 foot high with a pointed top. I use my sword to, to, to detect good on it. It's not good, Eric. It's, it's a gazebo. Pause. I call out to it. It won't answer. It's, it's a gazebo. Another pause. I sheathe my sword and draw my bow and arrows. Does it respond in any way? No, Eric. It's a gazebo. I shoot it with my bow. Roll to hit. What happened? There is now a gazebo with an arrow sticking out of it. Pause. Wasn't it wounded? Of course not, Eric. It's a gazebo. Little whimper. But that was a plus three arrow. It's a gazebo, Eric. A gazebo. If you really want to try to destroy it, you could try to chop it with an axe, I suppose. Or you could try to burn it. But I don't know why anybody would even try. It's a fucking gazebo. Long pause. He has no axe or fire spells. I run away. Uh, the GM, thoroughly frustrated. It's too late. You've awakened the gazebo. It catches you and eats you. Eric, reaching for his dice. Maybe I'll roll up a fire using mage so I can avenge my paladin. At this point, the increasingly amused fellow party members restored a modicum of order by explaining to, explaining to Eric what a gazebo is. Thus ends the tale of Eric and the Dread Gazebo. It could have been worse, at least the gazebo wasn't on a grassy knoll. 
Thus ends the tale of Eric and the Dread Gazebo. A little vocabulary is a dangerous thing. I read this out because it is very famous and very classic. But I don't think everyone knows it. So I wanted everyone to make sure I wanted to make sure that everyone, you know, had a chance to know it. Anyway, let's move on to the next story. The next story is Sir Barrington. It's a short one. You may know it, but just for those of you who don't know it, here it is. Uh, this is the um, story of a player who basically um, made a bear. Yeah, let's let's get into it. Uh, the player makes a bear character in D and D three point five. DM laughs. Make the bear a rogue. And I put every point I can into disguise. Prestige class as a spy to get more dis disguise. The DM says I can't speak English. I max out bluff. By growling and gesturing, I can fake speaking a language I don't speak. English. I use money to hire a butler NPC. And I give him a magical item to let him speak bear. Ah, an excellent suggestion, Mr. Barrington. We really should ask the group to investigate the Black Marsh. Over the course of the game, I'm knighted as Sir Barrington. The Queen holds a dinner in my honour. A guest becomes the first man ever to make a perception check that can beat my disguise. He shouts out very loud. Hey, that's not a guy, he's just a bear. Man is escorted out of the castle while the guards apologise profusely for the indignity. We're so sorry, Sir Barrington. Very, very sorry for this man's behaviour. And shrug. <laughs> and that's the story of Sir Barrington uh, in a D&D in &D game uh, where a player played a bear. And basically gamed the system so that he could be a bear, but everyone thought he wasn't a bear. Which is just beautiful. And says a lot about gamers, doesn't it? Okay. So... There are the first couple of stories. The next one we'll get to uh, in the future will be uh, the story of Old Man Henderson, a player who accidentally figured out how to win at Call of Cthulhu. So we'll get to that soon. But let's uh, let's grab uh, Karis in here, who wants to tell a story. Hello. Hello and welcome. So yes. It's a simple story of how a back alley doctor basically joined a chaos war band. Uh, sorry, a what doctor? A back alley doctor, like he literally operated in a back alley. He didn't have an office oh. or anything, he operated straight in an alley. Okay, back alley doctor. Yes. Uh, I would like to say this first, he was a Plague Meister, Alliance Nurgle, Black Crusade. So we're talking uh, Black Crusade system. Yes. And he was a plague marine or just a plague? Nah, plague meister. Okay, so Basically, like a human who worships Nuggle. Yes, and knows how to identify plagues and shit and make plague. Okay. So, it all starts with the party has just done some interrogation of some random person. Hmm. So they drive on their bikes and find this alley that has a terrible stench coming from the alley itself. Okay. Uh, this character called Ingrid, which is a Kim Hunter, comes down there and is like, The fuck is this smell? 
Oh, uh, sorry. Is the chem hunter like someone who hunts chems like drugs or make like makes them? Basically, they are dependent on a very specific drug. If they don't take it, they get minuses to stats. Ah, uh, okay. So they're like a hunter who has to take drugs to. Yeah, they also come from a Mad Max kind of world, so that's fun. <laughs> okay, yeah. And basically, uh, this character realizes that's an Urglite, and I can smell it. Mm. And I'm like, what? No, I'm not. And said person literally shows me the gun that has a big cast down. It's like, we are on the same team. I'm like, oh, well, shit, yes, of course. Meanwhile, I was operating on something that was nearly a corpse anyway. So the, t the party met you in a dark alleyway where you're <laughs> messing with a corpse? I was pa he was a patient that arrived but died under operation. No way. Let, let's not waste the organs now, shall we? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So, you're a back alley Nurgleite doctor. Who, yes. You were operating on a patient who came to get better and he died, so you're like, ah, oh, well, I'm still. I've got other things I can do with this body, so let's just keep going. Exactly, like, I can incubate diseases with it. Okay, and that sure. comes in in a like later part where I'm on the ship. Okay. So back to it. Uh, they say we're about to go hit a like arbiter station up and fucking destroy it with a bunch of random citizens. I'm like, and they say, do you want to join? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? And I just leave the dead body in the alley, leave it in it. Okay. So we drive to this place and somehow. Like, it, it's a fierce fight. We got, like, a horde of fucking citizens of Hivas just rushing in, taking the brunt of the force, and getting fire grenaded. Mm. I run off to, like, the side where there is least resistance, and somehow I managed to convince two of the Arbites to surrender. And I had, like, I think, minus 10 or 20 to the roll. But you rolled well, so it... Of course, I rolled so yeah. well that they're like, all right, yep, nope. All right, you, you make a good argument that you don't want to kill us and that we could just end this by putting our weapons down. Mm. Like any good Nurglad would. Basically, trying to convert them. Yeah. And, well, it's all going good. Uh, a lot of the people died. Like, we are talking a fuckload of the people that came to raid the Arby station with us. Uh, so, like, NPCs, but on your side. Yes, like, yeah. the, it was basically the equivalent of a horde minion. Mm. There was a bunch of them. But you had, like, a horde up against you as well from the other side, right? Nah, nah, we didn't. Oh. There was only a few people, but they were fully armed arbites, so... Uh, okay. And we just wrecked the shit out of them. We, that, there was also, like, a Slanishi that basically seduced some of them as well. So okay. basically, one of them sedu was seduced to shoot the captain that, was, that had a grenade launcher with incendiary grenades. <laughs> so, you had a literal horde of NPCs helping you attack the Arbite, <laughs> and you guys decided, instead of, like, just overwhelming them and, and like, you know, just tidal wave on them, to convince them to surrender and seduce them to kill each other? <laughs> that, no, that's just me and the fucking Slanishi. The other two are trying to kill him. Okay. Were they were they both corn? No. <laughs> uh, we got Ingrid, which is a unaligned. The one that came up to me. Yeah. And then we had someone else that was another Slanishi fleshcrafter kind of person. Oh, two Slanesh. That's going to be an interesting yes. campaign. One Nurglide. And then one on the line. Also, I think there was three Slanishi, but at that time, the third one was on the brink of dropping out. So, oh, okay. Well, at least you didn't have a Zinch and a Corn worshipper together. <laughs> Cause... Oh, don't worry. Uh, we 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 got an a Zinch, a Zinch boy now. Zinch, Zinch, uh, Zinch is my favorite. But yeah, actually, we have two fucking Zinchians. Oh shit. <laughs> So, yeah, we basically took over the station, and as a doctor who has his license revoked, I immediately began operation on the dead and dying. Okay. 
I somehow, through having an extremely high int stat, managed to heal some of them and at the same time come basically start a Nurgle cult? Out of the Arbite? No, out of the people that were dead and dying. Oh, okay. Yeah, basically the people were healing on a base. Basically, while I was teaching them to get again, I was like, you know, this Nurgle guy, he's quite alright, you know. <laughs> like, I, I just made him into this really friendly person. Oh, also we got to pick our starting mutation. Mm. So, eh, Mark, no, no, no not Nurgle no called the zombies, no. Sadly. Yeah, I, I was gonna ask if, like, because you said dead and dying, and I was like, did you convert dead Well, I, I most likely used a few organs from the dead and put it into the others. Yeah. So, after doing that, we returned to HQ, which was some hat-block place, and there was end session. Okay. Next well, session... Uh, yeah, we are at the place, and suddenly, uh, we get inquisitorial troops surrounding us. Okay. Good, right, proper fun. And the Inquisitor herself arrives as well. And, and we don't get killed or anything. They don't mm. attack us. Very surprisingly, we don't get attacked. Well, I'm going to assume this was, like, early in the game, like, in the campaign. No, like, I actually joined in, like, they oh. have already been doing a lot of shit. I just kind of joined in, okay. like, in the, well, in the middle of the campaign. Yeah, I was, Also, I was, in the middle of that session, I also joined in. I was going to say, if you... If, if you have, were just starting, throwing an Inquisitor at you is an interesting te technique. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry, it, it gets better when we reach the newer parts. Mm. So, uh, basically, this Lanishi, again, somehow managed to, to friend, befriend this Inquisitor who we're working against. Okay. And the best part is that there's also these two gangs, like the Noble Lights, who have made their own little gang of professional fucking soldiers and shit. Mm. And then there was the War Dogs, who are basically Imperial Gangers. And those two factions were at war, and we sided with the War Dogs. Okay. As they were building a giant fuck off tank. As as gangers do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it actually had a Bane Blade cannon on it. Oh god. How the hell yeah. did they get their hands on a Bane Blade cannon? <laughs> I don't know. They have been building that thing for I don't know how long. Okay. Oh. So, there we are. The Inquisitor fucked off again after like a rocket squad of the Warthogs came and missed all their missiles at the fucking Valkyrie that flew away. Mm. So we're like, yeah, we gotta find a new HQ. Oh, also at that point, I was not even at the base. I was on my way back. And I got this very fun talent called Paranoia. And we do it like... We homebrew that a little and say I roll d20. If I get over 10, I can feel Paranoia. Under, I don't feel shit. So, of course... I... On my way back, well, paranoia. All right, you can feel something amiss, and like, oh shit! I turn to my new cultist and like, all right, everybody, spread out. Try to find a place we can lay low. And I go back to the HQ. Also, I have this nice talent of unremarkable. Mm. That's useful. It really is, and especially for a plague master. Well, yeah, and you were in a hive, right? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So, they spread out to find a place to basically lay the fuck low. Mm. Everything's good. Everything's jolly. 
and we basically just go around doing things after the Inquisitor left. Also then, I had to roll awareness for my, like, cultist. One of them rolled an at one and found a fully stuck clinic. Uh. And that is how my cult became based in a clinic. Oh. What uh, what like height of the hive were you at? I'm assuming like the lower. Uh, pretty fucking low. Yeah. Okay. So for for people who don't know very quickly, uh, in a Warhammer forty thousand hive, there's a there's like a tier. The higher up you go, the more like the richer people are, the better off they are. There's a point where the hive will go underground. And uh, down there is, like, gangs and, you know, just, like, people with no money and just horrible everything. Everything bad happens at the bottom of the hive, basically. Now, I also imagine that this hive basically also had other bad shit happening all over because there were snowballites that had formed their own gang as well, so. Mm. Real good time. Sorry, buddy, there. And like most of the clinics in the area, they were not open or had supplies to do shit. Yeah. I was the only place they could come. That's, but I had... Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say, that's going to make it really easy to... Start an infection, but that's not how I started an epidemic in that hive. Oh, no, of course not. Yeah. Be silly, <laughs> that is yeah. something. Be, si be silly to Yeah, like, I, I never got to open the doors of my oh, clinic okay. before I had to leave for the sh bigger ship in space. Okay. Oh. Uh. And yeah, it's a nice clinic, fully stocked. I begin writing in a book. My medical knowledge into a book. Okay. And very slowly, that book begins to turn more and more nuclear as well. That's right, I'm making a daemon book. Oh. Yeah, it's good fun. But I have to roll Medicaid in the start. Yeah. And it goes pretty damn well. And I also give, like, my cultists the book so they can look in it and basically read it after, make their own books, and then spread the books through the hive. Mm. Get more cultists. Also, I think the Slanisha person also had their own cult going. But mine was actually growing more rapidly because, yeah, it was not good times for anybody there. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we get like in session around Dash. And then the next session comes to. Big assault on the bloody rich noble. No, there was something before that, actually. Okay. So, I... We also meet this Inquisitor at the noble's house. And I had made virus bombs. Of course. Yes. Because it's always fun when you have Medicaid and tech use and can combine the two into something beautiful like that. It, were, were they like, were they like Imperial Tech virus, or was it like Chaos Nurgle? Virus? It was homemade virus bombs. Okay, so maybe a little bit Nurgle with some Imperial Tech and stuff. As well. Yeah, like it, it's just like I had a bunch of scrap, built it into a bomb, inserted a dose of diff scraps. Mm. And of course, you had the the clinic, so <laughs> ah, but I did not set off the bomb there. <laughs> Oh, no, no, but you had gear to make it. The yeah. yeah. Also, I literally had, like, I think, I played my guest to start with five doses of a disease, if I'm not wrong. Okay. But yeah, sadly, I did some occultists out to basically plan the bomb. The two I sent out never returned. Okay. So I go out searching for him with somebody else. Uh, find out that a bunch of homeless druggies got my bomb and basically infected themselves by being like, I think we can get high on this. 
And then when we arrive, they believe we are the fucking Arbites. Okay. And we get shot at. I get hurt pretty badly. But we manage to kill him. I go up and see. Wait, that's only half a dose. Fuck. So, go back, refill it, and then I also get two virus grenades. But basically, we get to the noble house and I plant the fucking bomb there. And basically, the way it was planted is pretty ingenious with what happened. Okay. Oh god, pile, no, you're not getting fucking power armor. <laughs> You are already a Raku, you don't need no more! So yeah, basically... End session there, got a new stuff, been to the little manor place. Yeah. Planted a bomb in a sewer. All good time. The day of the assault comes, and... Because I'm a slow as fuck person, I get a moped to ride around. Moped, okay, mopeds, yeah. Yeah. And, like, I'm riding around the fucking battlefields on a moped, having great fun. Not doing much. Somehow get up to the wall and throw a Rivus grenade in. It works. And, basically, the assault fails. The big ass fucking, like, tank they had get destroyed okay and, this and their is, leader this is the tank that the gangers were making yeah they that weren't... war okay war hounds war dogs had yeah and war dogs leader is basically a heavily cybernetic man he gets infected with scrap code scrap code yes basically right. shit the fucks up technology to the point of it no work. Kind of like a vir uh, like a yeah. virus type thing. Yeah, just very much worse. As it hits the machine spirit directly. Yeah. And makes it very fucking hostile. So, the assault failed, but uh, my bomb goes off, and suddenly the sewer is infected with the grasp. A few people in the manor is also infected with this grass from the grenade I threw. And we leave planet. Like, and like, yep, nope, no more. We gonna get the fuck out now. Okay. And everything's good. On the planet, that's the start of the epidemic. Yeah. And of course, my cut was still on planet. And had a fully stock clinic. And that is how you basically infect the whole fucking planet. <laughs> and there's more great stories, a lot more. Yeah. No, I mean like So so you you guys as players and as let's call it a party for the sake of argument. Like Of course. Did you have a ship or did you like Oh no, the ship is owned by a Cornate Warlord. Okay. Like, we got all five factions of Chaos on this one ship. Hmm. And here's how it was divided, the ship. The Nurglites got the medical bay, because we know how the body works and how diseases work. Yeah. The Cornates got the mess hall, so guess what was on the menu every day? Meat. And of dead course. people. Uh, the sentients, they were all psychos, so they had basically taken some weird section of the ship and did warby shite to it. Mm. And the Slanishi owned the motor pool and had tech priests. Meanwhile, the middle of the ship is basically free man's land of unaligned. Alright, so that's where everything connects. Like, like, uh, you mean like Chaos Undivided? Yeah. Yeah. Chaos Undivided basically had a, like, the four main guys had like big ass interests, 
And the underwriters had a tiny little door. Yeah. Off to the side. Yeah. In this massive room that's like that's the Carnate way, there's also an arena. That's the Sinchins, you probably don't want to go there. Wait, the, that's an Erglites. The um the Sinchians had a we, they had their, I, an arena. No, that's the that's the corn. Eggs. Oh, the core. Okay, so the corn. Yeah, because an arena, yeah. we're getting to my second story of how I began a new plague, created my very own plague. Did, did you do it on the ship? <laughs> yes, I did. I incubated <laughs> it on the ship. You did, but you didn't release it on the ship. No, no, I did not release it on ship. Also. Just for everybody here, uh, Felix claimed the bathroom as his fucking room. Yeah, and Felix is your the character that you're. Yes, Felix. Felix, okay. He basically took our bathroom and like this is where I live. <laughs> and he, he then does, comes. He, he does sound like a back alley hobo doctor, doesn't he? <laughs> It's just, yes. like, it's just like I've got this. There's this whole ship, and we different factions yes. are claiming different things. And the Nurgle back alley doctors just like I want the toilet. Exactly. Also, that's not the best part. I I also like get to choose my first starting mutation because our GM is very merciful, and we could also choose a gift of the gods. So of course, I have a bunch of Nurglings inside my body. Okay. And so comes the woeful day of arena fight after I basically make my acquaintance with the head nerd light. So arena battle, we fight an orc. And this orc has some like we, we beat it up pretty fucking good. Mm. The Slanishi is there because she's new as well. She has some minions she can use, I got nothing. I go to bed before I can end the fight, sadly. Or rather, I had to leave before I could end the fight. Then I come back again, and the orc is dead, and had been injected with some kind of weird Dark Elder drug that made it very ferocious, but also killed it. Ah, uh, yeah. Dark Elder drugs are always fun. Yeah. So, basically, uh, I took a sample of the drugs, like, yep. Very beautiful, beautiful, nice. That's mine now. And then I took the orc body as well. Yeah. Uh, back in my toilet laboratory, as it began to be, uh, I put the orc body in one of the like toilet stalls and took off some of the like fungus meat and basically began making a new disease. Based around orcs. Yes, it was specifically targeted towards orcs. It can be used later, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it has come in use a fucking lot. Well, yeah, and I, okay. I basically made Nurgle's Rod out of it. And of course, I had to come up with a different name. Mm. And I called it Green Rot. Green Rot, okay. Yep. Also, it was very fungal based. One of my nerglings ate one of the aided. And I called him Rod from then on. And he was. Also, he has become like a dog now. Uh, the, the, uh, were the nerglings still living in you at this point? or? Yes. Okay, so they just. Like, oh, also, I ate one of. You ate what? Basically, back to the hobo story of yeah. them taking my bomb, uh, I ate one of the corpses and got infected and got Blessings of Nurgle shape oh, happening okay. to me. Lovely time. I then... Yeah, then back to now. Uh, I basically make this good old little disease. Nurgling eats it. I can now have an infinite amount and slowly harvest it. Nice. And then, of course, the orc corpse has not been infected with it. So I do the only sensible thing and begin to become a weed dealer. 
Sure. I take out some weed seeds and basically pop it into the eyes of the orc. And that's how I began to grow weed on the ship. Lovely times, as I say. Come on. And, and of course... Come on, yes? You carry on. Er, uh, then comes the next mission, which is on an agriculture world. That's been invaded by orcs. So, now, now this thing's... Now this new disease I made sounds pretty good to have. Mm. So, we get down on planet to a little village. That we make up base of operation. And we basically begin doing shit, like Ooh. finding out where the orcs are, getting resources and stuff, and then find out the Dark Elder is also on planet, and they have directed the orcs all along. But that's not even the, all of it. Okay. As the Dark Elder plan to test a new prototype of weapon. And we go fuck up the orcs as well. Alright. So, you're, you're currently. We, we basically oh. get to the local planetary defense force. Mm. Also, we have taken a tech priest as a hostage. So, it's, it's, it's an imperial world, but. Yes, and they don't know we are chaos, so. Yeah. And both the Everything's Eldar fine. and the Orcs are fucking around on the world too. The Dark Eldar specifically. Da Dark Eldar and the and the Orcs. Yes, the Dark Eldar is using the Orcs as a smoke screen. Okay. Okay. We go to this like forging town, industrious town. Find the head honcho. Turns out he he's the one. He he's feeding information to the Dark Eldar. Mm. Like where well, there is a nice juicy target for them to go raid. Next target is of course the place we come from. So we're a bit like, oh hell no. And we basically beat him up a bit, rough him up. Uh, he had an assistant with him as well. I fixed him with green rods. He was not having a good time. He was in a lot of fucking pain. Yeah. So, also we got a new player at this point, whose character was called Strongtooth, and was a human that grew up around orcs. <laughs> Alright, kind of a dog. Yes! <laughs> okay. Just, yep. like, like, raised by wolves, yeah, okay. Yeah, just raised by orcs. <laughs> sure, that sounds interesting. Yep. So... We fuck off from the place, go back. Also, I think that one of the Slanishis basically become an undivided tech priest. Okay. Heretic. Who then tried to convince a dishwasher to basically become rebellious. <laughs> like, you can hear that a lot of shenanigans have been going on in this campaign. <laughs> I, I assume all of the time, and it wasn't like you turning up for uh, being like, uh, ah, yes, I'm, I'm making toilet uh, viruses and then spreading exactly. them through walks. It, it's not um, just me. Yeah, it's a yeah. bunch of fun stuff. So we go back to the village, organize a proper defense, and everything's just fucking bad. Like, the Dark Elder comes. Or rather, it's an org attack that starts first. Uh, we beat the orcs up, kill him, stab him. All that good stuff. I even begin using a baleful dirge. Lovely times. Make any roll, any roll you make is a minus 10. Or something like that. Yeah. Half action to basically maintain the dirge of... I'ma kill you, plagues, Nurgle. And 
It's a fun time. We killed the orcs. They retreat. Strongtooth managed to basically wrestle a few of the orcs into servitude. Okay. And then the Dark Guild arrive, and we're basically... Wait, there's some people over there! Kill them! Okay. And they die very, very easily. They they don't stand a chance. Mm. They they got bad armor, bad wounds. They die very painfully and quickly. And then we fuck off from that town again and go to a local like town with actual military person. Yeah. Then we friendly recruit him into basically helping us. And this friendly thing included Ingrid going, taking the leader's face, smashing it into the table. Good times. And then end session. Because next session, it was only me and one other person. Ingrid that showed up. So we had our own little mini session. Oh god, when when players get not all the time to themselves it's terrible, because they could just go Oh, we went drinking, my boy! <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that could have been worse depending on what you do when you went drinking. Uh, well, basically it started with just a little beer, nothing much. No toughness test required. Then a drinking contest where I won. And basically, I just won contest after contest. Mm. Also, I think that the GM was the other player as well, because our usual GM had to do something that day. Okay. And basically, I get a minus so much that I have to roll under a 10. And I was so close to actually rolling under a 10. That was unbelievable. Okay. I um I assume in this system you get uh fate points as well. You get infamy points here. Infamy, okay. And that's related to a character characteristic called infamy. Let's that... say you have forty infamy, then you get four infamy points. Okay. And that so allows like... you to reroll? Yes. Okay. And do other stuff like heal yourself and all that. Yeah. Basically, normal fate point usage just relates to a specific stat. Yeah. Also, that stat is basically your profit factor as well. And it's, it's the best thing. Infamy is different for each person. Mm. So, like, one guy may have 40 and another guy have 20 in for me. And I think at the moment I have like 60 something in for me. I'm really infamous, apparently. Okay. Well, you are the creator of a worldwide virus. Semi -accident well, uh... semi accidentally? <laughs> <laughs> no, I sadly did not get worldwide that I've got quarantined. Well, still. Technically, it's a hive wide fucking hive -wide, epidemic. Yeah. It, it like it the number of people in a fucking hive is enough for the entire planet. Yeah, I Earth, think I actually so. even got infamy from doing that. Yeah, like when I reached a certain threshold, my team was like, "All right, roll a d five and gain that amount of infamy." And I'm like, "All right, lovely." So we basically go around. I basically out drink nearly everyone in the bar mm. uh, are you still there we may have lost him I think we have, in fact, 
lost Karis for now. What, what, okay, so it, while we're giving him a moment to um, get back, what do you think this story should be called? I, I liked I liked the uh, I liked the tech the heretic tech priest, um, s like seducing a dishwasher to the dark side. That that, that was an interesting thing. Uh, I'm back. Hello. Oh, there we go. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I lost the internet connection for a second. Lovely. Ah, no problem. So, where was it? What what? Hello? Ah, hello. Uh, what point did I cut off on? Uh... Was it the bar burnt down? Uh, yes, about that. Alright, the bar burnt down, there was no building no more. Okay. There were people... on the floor with knife wounds. It was not good for them. Mm. And of course, as this professional excommunicated doctor that I am, begin to help him up. I, I do some Medicaid, they all survive. Or most of them do. Yeah. I get paid for my troubles. Did you also and... tell them about our Lord and Savior, Nogal? <laughs> nah, nah, not this time. I was not allowed by the GM. Oh, okay. She was like, alright. You gotta calm down, buddy. You already got a cult going. I'm like, all right, all right. And basically, I continue doing my thing. I write in my book, which begins to need more pages now. I basically buy a few blank books, rip out the rip out all the pages and put into my own book. It works. And I basically managed to make my book even bigger. Okay. And I write in it and all that. It's all good. Get a few uh, nets. Ones to five. Which is... And that comes in very importantly later. Well, the... Because uh, it's a D100 system. Yes. Which means, like, like let's say, for example... The lower, the better. Yeah, ba basically, for people watching who don't know the 40k D100 systems, um, you'll have a uh, like a characteristic like uh, toughness. Yeah, toughness or agility, and it will be like let's say 33. To do certain skills, you have to roll below that number on a D100. So you roll a D100, you have to roll below a 33 to be successful. The bigger margin between your skill number and the rumpy number you roll is degrees of success and failure. So it yeah, can... like for every ten, it's a degree. Yeah. So if you're like, let's say you're using strength to pick up a table, if you have one degree of success, you probably do it, but not brilliantly. If you get like six degrees of success, you slam it against the ceiling accidentally, kind of thing. You know, like like. Yeah, yeah. So it, you do it too well. The the nice thing about the system is it allows for extremes of success as well as like smaller successes and smaller failures and things like that. Um, rolling a 1 to 5 is basically a crit success, almost like a nat 20 in D&D. &D. Sorry, uh, I just wanted people to know the context. Of course, of course. Right Very stuff. important knowledge to have about this. So, I basically read in my book, use my Medicaid skill, which I think at that moment is plus 20 and a plus 10 from a Master Cherrigan. Because that's how good I become. And everything goes nice. Yeah. Close the book, even more nerdly, beginning to stink a little. I get a bottle of Jack Daniels out of it as well. 
It was just a weird little... F it was just weird. Uh, also, I'm alone for most of this session. <laughs> As the only, like, player that is not any GM kind of person. So, uh... I gotta go assault a... Like, little orc outpost. I'm like, alright, let's do it. Uh, the outpost is run by a mad dog. Hmm. Also, That's, for anyone uh... who don't know who a mad dog is, basically a pain boy who's a orc medic doctor yeah. person. So it's, it's just an more orc. insane. Yeah, it's 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 an orc with medical skills in inverted commas. Yes. Yeah. He got fighting shoes as well. Mm. So I'll go there. I'm the only one there, other than me and my billions of nerglings. I think at that moment I had like 12 nerglings living inside my body. Okay. And I got down a Scylla kind of way. Got some local PDF boys with me to help. And Ingrid. But I go in alone through the dark Scylla. I managed to find a crate of outer guns. That's pretty nice. And then I found a dark heresy weapon. A weapon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. So I, I begin going up the stairs. There's an orc that looks directly at me. I look directly at him. Fight ensues. I somehow manage to kill the orc. Somehow. And I make my way further up, and there's, of course, a lot more orcs. I'm like, ooh. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Not good. And then Ingrid and the other NPCs basically attack the front door, causing the orcs to go that way. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Perfect. Throw a chloroform grenade! Because <laughs> I made a few gas grenades of chloroform. It didn't work on any of the orcs, and I've been like, well, shit. Yeah, orcs have quite high toughness. Yeah, like yeah. an Urglite has. Yeah. I think at the moment I'm on 60 something toughness. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'll... And yeah. an unnatural toughness as well. No, no, Nurgle gets very tanky, as I remember. So, after that encounter, I somehow end up in a melee fight with an orc, and I somehow drive it back by throwing an incendiary grenade into its face. Also, I'd like to mention, at this point, I have 22 wounds, or something like that. 20-something wounds. Yeah. And I somehow managed to fend off the orc and survive with, like, 15, 40 wounds left. Yeah. And from that, I'm basically... Plus, I also got a new mutation at that point. A Chaos Organ. And if you're Nurglite, you get to basically have regeneration. Oh, okay, yeah. So I regenerated some health. Like, I'm gonna stay in here and regenerate a bit. I I'm fine now. Good. <laughs> and basically, I find a key. It's the key to the Mad Duck's fighting juice. And I have fun with that. Yeah. I basically just steal it. And sadly, at that time, it was so late that I had to get some sleep. Oh. When we finally got to fight the big bad person, yeah. I had to leave and get some sleep. Next session is the actual GM, and there's a lot of people. Everything's good. And. Basically, at that time, there was also another player that joined on in when I had to leave. Mm. A strong tooth, the old woman. 
So yeah, we basically next session find out where the dark elders are hiding. Like not a lot goes on there, and session ends with us finding the place. Next session again. We basically begin making our way over, sending our people to evacuate a few towns that are gonna get targeted by this new bloody super weapon. Okay. Uh, we send out some people to destroy some of the outposts of the Dark Elder. On the way, we go around and looting some special caches. And I get. My new favorite weapon of that game. Oh god, okay, yeah. I get a pestilence flail. Oh. Okay. First and foremost, you cannot parry this, you have to dodge. Because it has the. It's a flail, so it like goes around yeah, parry. It's, yeah. It's like flexible. I, uh. Just to sidebar very slightly. Uh, of I, course. I have a, uh, in, uh, Broke Trader Lost, uh, on EE's channel, um, yeah. we have two players with parry, and in Rogue Trader Frontier, we have one player with parry, and er all the time I'm, I'm tempted to just be like, let's just get loads of, like, whips and flails and stuff, so they just can't <laughs> parry the stuff and stuff. Oh, oh, that, not, not, that's beautiful. Yeah. And basically, I can't parry with this thing either. Mm. But every time I use it, I get a plus 10 to dodge. Also, I can't remember all the stats for it, but I think it also have like crippling or concussive. One of the two. Yeah. And I'm not about to go check it. So, I get that. I have shit melee. Like, 30-something melee. Weapon skill thing. Yeah. And it ends up with us. We reach the place. I also get a new sh assault shotgun. And I basically also get amputates around. Or rather, shells. Adding pen to my shotgun. Nice. Cause... And it can go semi-auto as well. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, I get, we get to the place. Uh, I miss every goddamn single shot. Even with, like, plus 30 and stuff, I was rolling so poorly. And I was reaching a point of, um, I'm just gonna go to bed. It's not my night right now. Mm. I managed to get one last, like, attack in. There was like a dark guild by a window looking out at me. I put the shotgun in through the window and semi also his face off. It was a fun time there. Yeah, that, that was that was fun. Fight, fighting fighting dark elders always interesting because yeah. they they're so dodgy and agile. It's hard to hit them sometimes. Yeah, and this one he he couldn't. He didn't dodge and got like three. I think I got maximum amount of shots in, so that's like three amputator shells into his face. Oof. Yeah. That's yeah. He he died very quickly, yeah. say the least. I would say that uh, Warhammer 40k is very deadly in its TTRPG systems. Except for oh, yeah. you wouldn't think so with the way with the way uh, Charlie Foxtrot's been going. <laughs> exactly. I know how deadly it is because uh, the amount of people I've killed in that game is astonishing. Mm. The amount of people I've killed in Charlie Foxtrot, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 one of those things. Like, I'll uh, on a on another thing of uh, this show. I'll have to go through like all of the all, all of the instances where people have survived in Charlie Foxtrot, even though they shouldn't. Um, just just because of like my bad rolls and yeah, the the app the orc sniper uh. that blew himself up is a great example. Oh boy. Uh, it was. Uh, I'll I'll just tell the story very quickly. 
Um, of course. It was the uh, the episode with the first induction of the Naboom Bangshi Regiment, and the commander came in, uh, McLoken came in with a couple of other players to play as them. And I had an orc with a snaz gun. Uh, at, they were two uh, blood axe knobs uh, looking to take out the commander. Uh, the melee blood axe knob was like walking around being all big and badass and being like, hur, hur, hur. Uh, and then there was a, a, a like smaller knob who was a uh, a sniper. And I was like, uh, what can I what can I use as like almost like a sniper gun? And there was the snaz gun, so I was like, "All right, let's use that." Um, he got an ambush on the commander, rolled to hit because he had like a hundred meter range, uh, rolled to hit and rolled a one hundred. <laughs> so his, his oh. so his gun blew up and blew his arm off, and he crawled away. And one of the other players found him a little bit later down an alley, dead of blood loss. Well, shit. <laughs> and he'd booby-trapped his body with a grenade, and the player went, I chuck a grenade at him and walk away. And I was like, yep. <laughs> totally makes sense. <laughs> so, so, like, his... his, oh. his uh, th this, was, this was supposed to be, like, one of the main... Uh, this was supposed to be one of the main dangers of this session, was, like, these two orc knobs. And the other, the other uh, orc knob fought the guard like some guardsmen one of the players was was there uh he ran in and and did a whole load of damage to them and the player uh i think the player got injured before that and he was on like one wound so i had mm -hmm. i i i get like he basically oh no he walked into a trap and got hit by a trap like a big ah ah a big chopper just flew down and hit him in like square in the chest and he's like Ooh. he's like on the floor bleeding out and i'm like one of the npc field medics battlefield medics runs in to save you and i rolled a d100 for the battlefield medic uh uh medicaid to to save his life it was not one or something i rolled it at one yeah <laughs> So, <laughs> oh. so what happened was I act I actually um because I rolled a nat one, this is like, yeah, he's definitely saved. So I gave him the option of being carried away uh back to the kind of HQ for the regiment. Like back to safety. Back to safety. Uh and he was like, uh yeah, okay. So he, you know, took a new character to play for like the very end of the of the session but right. his character survived just as the giant orc knob ran around the corner and decimated everyone there <laughs> so he was he was like being dragged away on a stretcher and it was like i was like oh, i god <laughs> like, uh. not 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 to mention rolling a 99 on an orc weird boy power roll oh so oh boy it was a crit fail it was a double and it was nines it it i'm not i won't i won't tell that story yet i'll tell that story another time but that was a ridiculous right. story uh anyway um there was one other thing i think uh yeah rad k wants you to tell the pocket grenade story yes he he has dm'd me about it Okay, so if you'd like to say that, and then I'll do a couple of other stories from other places. Sure, sure. I might just mute myself in the meanwhile. Sure. Oh, uh, I meant if you tell the pocket grenade story, I'll move on to the other stories after that. Ah, all right. There you go. Uh, the pocket grenade. All right. Where well, the, f which one was it? Uh, I got lost in all my stories. I explained. Oh. God dang. Uh. Fuck. <coughs> Pardon me. Ah, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, if if you want to 
discuss with Radke about the pocket grenade story, I can uh, I can do a different story for. Oh, oh! I know exactly which one it is now. Okay. Yes, basically, this is a whole different game. Not my character. This is Radke's character. Okay. Er, uh, his name was Serge, and he was my arch militant. Rogue Trader. Yes. And I was basically a mechanicus heretic of the of a Logician boys. Okay. The Logicians are basically people that think like the thirty thousand millennia people like innovating is great. You should innovate more. Oh, so a little bit heretical. Very heretical yeah. by <laughs> adeptus mechanicus standards. Yeah. But yeah, we are basically at this one station. Called Lazarus Lack, run by Dark Elder. Okay. Er, uh, our Seneschal slash Master of Whisperers had gotten taken captured. Hmm. Because she was basically a fool, in a way, and went against some witches, she had the opportunity to leave the bloody arena. But she chose not to, and I became like... <laughs> Alright. And basically traded her off to some Otto Archon's son. After a big arena fight, battle. Yeah. So, uh... Radke... And... Me and my navigator... Or one of my navigators, goes to the... Lateral Glass Master. Explain to him the situation, and he's like, Alright, somebody go you there, you go kill him then. Mm. And it's like, sure. And Search goes to do it. He gets a camera on, goes to the arena to go fuck them up, and then another player character in just fray. Okay. They fight. It's wrong, bloody succubus. And the fight ends up with Surge is badly damaged. He's still alive, but he's gonna base. He, I think, he was some blood loss at that moment. Mm. Like friends. And he, yeah. So he. T took out a his hand towards his pocket and then blew himself up with a bunch of fucking grenades. How? Basically, he was not grappled or anything. He was down on his knees. Mm. The succubus was near him and then he took out a grenade and boom. And here's the most unbelievable thing. Yeah? Did he survive? No. Okay, okay, that's good. Actually, yes, kinda, in a oh, way. okay. <laughs> but that's a story for another time. Alright. <laughs> As the Dark Elder player dodged the whole explosion. A fucking Dark Elder, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and I was pissed, Surge was pissed, everyone was kinda like, Fucking hell! We were just pissed. Well, Dark Elder do do that. Um. Oh yeah, it was also just by one point. Oh, so it was like very close to yeah. Yeah, to hitting. Now, see, me personally, I enjoy Dark Elder players, but yeah, they they can be very very aggravating. Uh, with the yeah. dodging and everything. Especially at higher ranks, because they get multiple dodges. Um, yeah. It but... was just a... Oh, God! Infuriating have... moment. Uh, I I once did an offline game of Rogue Trader at like a higher rank for people who just wanted to try it and see what they thought of the game. Uh, game was like... Yeah, I, I only GM'd for a couple of sessions. They just wanted to try it out, and they wanted someone who was an experienced, you know, 40k GM. Um, 
and one of them chose to be an incubus. Which, if you don't know what an incubus is, oh boy, it it it's a dual wielding melee dark eldar class, and they had a lot of fun. It was very hard to do anything to them because they like they are possibly the strongest melee class in. It's like a subclass of Dark Eldar, I guess. But uh, yeah, it, it actually is like in a uh, expansion to the Darkkin. Yeah, they are so strong in melee because they don't hit super hard, but you can't hit them. Um. So yeah, it's. Uh... Also, if you want, I can tell you the story of how Surge died as well. Sure. He died a glorious death. Wait, he didn't die from the grenade? No! <laughs> he got a cybernetic body with no dingus. Oh, okay. He also managed to seduce the spy master out of her slanish possessed dress and proceeded to do the deed. Okay. Did he have, like, an attachment or something to help with No! <laughs> I don't know how he did it! Just friction, maybe? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> and then, of course, we get to the story of how the hell he died a most glorious Leroy Jenkins kind of death. Oh, his tongue wasn't cybernetic. <laughs> so, we basically go to this warehouse where... Do, do you know what a sloth is? Uh, I think it's so. the worm people. It, it's the worms. Yeah, the the it's like slough or something, isn't it? Like the F yeah, slough, slough, something like that. Yeah, they're not as well known in forty k, but I have a yeah. Idea. And it wants the fucking dress that my spy master has, mm. and I'm like, I told her not to get it. <laughs> and here we are again. And, like, we, we've been through so much shit that nearly every other post, I'm literally binary screeching at people. Mm. So, we get to the warehouse, we come in from one side, and that cabal that has the bloody succubus in it comes around the other side. And we basically begin... I am outside front door trying to figure out how the hell this alien device works and how to open the door. Mm. The big ass door. Cargo door. I managed to get it open, but at that point we got a gun cutter shooting at us. Uh, me and Serge get shot to bits. Mm. Somehow I survive the shots. And I get dragged in by, like, fake Skitari, because they were not fully cybernetic and shit yet. Okay. So I get dragged in. One of my Skitari turns insane, and then proceeds to shoot into me. And I'm like, Aah! And I already had a lot of fatigue, so I passed the fuck out. Sure. And, basically... Sir, she's out there playing dead now. And he crawl then he crawls inside and burns all his fate points to basically die the most Leroy Jenkins death you can imagine. Okay. He not only kills the Skitari, but I think he also somehow hurt the gun cutter. And he went out basically shielding me. With his body. As he was shot to fucking pieces. <laughs> by the gun cutter. I survived the encounter without having to burn a fate. Well, that's... As well, that, that's, for, that, that's pretty goddamn remarkable, I will say. Yeah. Not expected either. 
And that is how Surge died in the line of duty. And not by blowing himself up with his own grenades. Fair enough. <laughs> yes, it was not by his grenade. It was by saving the life of the captain. Well, and also a gun cutter opening. Yeah, line. that shot him to <laughs> bits with a heavy bolter. It was cr that, that was crazy, to be honest. Mm. As, like, inside the situation was, I had logician people on one side, Dark Guild on the other side, the slot and minions in the middle of it all. Yeah. It was just a big clusterfuck at that moment. And I think, like, as I basically turned unconscious, I was constantly binary screeching. Ah. Mm. Uh, I even use a GIF to do it, which uh, makes it so much better. <laughs> Here, uh, actually, let me just find a GIF real quick and put it in the voice chat. Okay. Yes, here it is. Oh, yeah, the... the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me a lot of the game. I don't think I have a way to chuck that up on... On the stream, it, it's uh for those of you who don't know, it it's basically a vibrating tech priest in a hooded cowl, uh, with like a little emote thing saying binary street. So it's a good yes. One. Um, all right, I will. I think I think what we'll do now is I'll read out a couple more uh stories that I've pulled up. And All right. then we'll go to the, uh, I believe Codus and uh, Edris Rex have posted up a couple, couple of their stories, so I'll read those out. Yeah, we got Codus and Edris Rex. Yes. Uh, oh, so, so, since we are two people, they, they could kind of choose who they want to re have it read up by. Well, I'll, 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 I'll do the reading out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks, Karis, for coming in and telling your stories. Hopefully, I assume you've got a little bit more of that. I got a lot more. Okay. For example, how the first session we went ship combat and nearly died. We nearly ended it all in session one. Oh yeah, yeah, that could. Yeah, that, there's a lot of stories from that one and from Fearless, and they're both still going. Awesome. All right. Yes. Well, uh, you're welcome to stay in the uh, the chat if you like. But yeah, I'm gonna do some uh, some other stories and stuff now. So oh, of course, I'm <laughs> just gonna mute myself. All right, let's stay here. So we're going to read out a few stories from other places. Uh, the first one is the story of Gog. He was an ogre. I haven't read this story before, but it seemed interesting, and it's not super long. So we'll go through that one. After that, we have the story of an evil campaign turned good. And then we have a couple of stories from Codus and uh, Lord Edris Rex uh, from the chat who have submitted their stories. So, first off, let's go with the story of Gog. I am Gog. I am strong. I am strong because I am an ogre. No one in the forest is stronger than me. When I was young, the old ogres make the rules. Hit me when I don't follow. Now I am older. I make rules. I go where I want. I eat what I want. I take what I want. One day, I find something I want. Pretty pink skin shark club, bright stones on short round end, and long sharp end shimmers like pond water. I want, so I take. Little hard shelled pink skins have come to my forest with shark clubs before, long time ago. They smarter than others. They know that they can't hit stronger, so they need to hit better. I am going to use pretty shark club to hit stronger and better. I am looking forward to using Sharp Club to hit. 
I'm not expecting Sharp Club to hit me. Sharp Club is alive. Sharp Club is angry. It does not want what I want, and so it hits me. I have been hit before. I am strong, so I can take hits. But it hits my mind, and I do not know how to hit back. For the first time in a long, long time, I submit. Sharp Club is strong. Sharp Club makes rules now. Sharp Club tells me what to do. Sharp Club makes me stop fighting others in forest. Makes me give up land. I do not want to, but Sharp Club makes rules now. I am not strong now. Eventually, Sharp Club stops being angry at me and starts being curious. Sharp Club tells me her name. She is Moonslicer, made by pink skin shamans for pink skin warriors. I understand this. She was made to kill pink skin enemies, but I am pink skin enemy. She does not kill me. I do not understand this. One day, while eating dinner, I asked Moonslicer, why do you not kill me? I don't understand your question, Moonslicer replies. You are pink skin, Sharp Club. Great sword, Moonslicer interrupts. And you are made to fight pink skin enemies. I was made to destroy evil, Moonslicer answers. She always talks in strange riddles. I have become used to this. Yes, evil. I know this word. It means pink skin enemy. I am pink skin enemy. I am evil. Why do you not destroy me? Moonslicer does not answer for a long time. You are pink skin enemy, yes. And most people would say you are evil. But I am not sure. I expected you to fight me, but you didn't. I expected you to resist when I told you to stop bullying the other creatures of the forest. But you didn't. Moonslicer is stronger than Garg, so Moonslicer makes rules. All the same, I think there might be some good in you somewhere. What is good? I ask. Good is... Moonslicer stops talking. I can feel she is confused. Good is... How to describe it? It is... She stops again. She is quiet for a long time. You know, I believe the best way to explain it is to show you. Go to sleep, Garg. Tomorrow, we will start doing good. <clears throat> Next day, Moonslicer leads me to Pinkskin home, in the middle of fields. No Pinkskin's there right now. She shows me broken walls, tells me to take stones and fix walls. Then we leave. I do not understand. Why do we fix walls, I ask? Those walls protect the humans from harm, Moonslicer says. They have been torn down by raiders over the years. By repairing the walls, you have made the humans more safe, more strong. Why do I make them safe, I ask. I am Pink Skin Enemy. I do not want them to be strong. Patience, Garg, Moonslicer says. Have patience and faith. You will understand eventually. I do not believe her, but I say nothing. This does not make sense. This is pink skin strangeness. For the next two seasons, Moonslicer keeps sending me out to pink skin lands, fixing walls, catching cows, and taking them back to the paddocks without eating them. Sometimes she makes me scare humans on roads. Sometimes. She makes me hide from humans on roads. She calls the ones I scare bandits, and the ones I hide from merchants. I do not understand the difference. The merchants are weaker humans, Moonslicer says. The bandits are stronger and want to take from the merchants. You are driving them away from the roads so that they do not take from the merchants anymore. This makes sense, I say. They are stronger, they take what they want. 
but why do you make me scare them so that they cannot? Because it is not good for the strong to take what they want from the weak. This good does not make sense, I, I will never understand. You will understand, Moonslicer says. Have faith. For many more seasons, Moonslicer makes me do things I do not understand. Eventually, pink skins, humans, start to see me. At first they are afraid. I understand this. But they slowly become less afraid. They no longer run when they see me. I do not understand this. I dig long ditches from the river to their farms. I build walls along their roads. I bring large sacks of food to their towns and leave them there. One season, there is a great storm. Moonslacer wakes me during the night, urges me to leave the cave and go to the human lands. There is a town I have been near many times before. The river that flows through the village is flooding. The humans are splashing, shouting, drowning. They are scared. Moonslicer sends me through the flood to their homes. I lift humans from the water and put them at the top of the homes. I do this again and again. I am tired, but Moonslicer pushes me on. I save more humans. I wade through the water that is up to my chest. I save the male humans, the female humans, the young humans, the old humans. I save all of them. When dawn comes and the rest of and the water goes down, I am more tired than I have ever been. I sink to my knees. I know that humans will kill me while I am asleep, but I am too tired to get away. I fall asleep. I wake up. I am not wet, cold or tired. I am warm, dry, resting on something soft and comfortable. I recognise it as a human barn. I have brought escaped horses to these before. I am covered in many skins. I am lying in dried grass. The humans call it hay. A male human comes in. He sees I am awake. He does not run or look scared. Instead, he smiles. He brings a large bundle up to me. The bundle has meat in it. Good cooked meat. Better than I ever tasted. I watch him carefully, but I am hungry and I concentrate on eating. Once I am done, he takes the bones and bundle and the bundle away. The day goes by and many humans come to the barn. Some hide by the door and stare at me. Others come in. I recognize many of them as the humans I saved last night. I am still tired, so I lie in the barn. I feel... I do not know how to describe it. The humans do not threaten me, but not because I am stronger. Finally, in the evening, many humans come to the barn. They bring Moonslicer with them. I have been negotiating with the humans on your behalf, she says. They are going to give you this barn to live in as a new home. They will give you food while you keep the road safe from bandits and help them tend their flocks and fix their buildings. I will stay with you to guide you. I am quiet for a long time. I do not understand, I say. If I was strong and I came to take these things, they would not give them to me. They would run or fight. But you didn't come to take them, Moonslicer replied. And that is what makes the difference. You have made the humans' homes safe. You have protected their merchants, and you have rescued their animals. Now, you have saved their lives. And because you gave and gave and did not take, they now want to give to you, freely. And as long as you do not wish to take, you will receive. By serving them, you are now more free than you ever were in the forest. Not because you are strong, but because you are a friend. They are your strength now, and you are theirs. This is what good is. And I understand. 
the end. That was a nice story. I like how the chat was completely silent while I was telling the story as well. It's just like, shh, don't interrupt him. Um, well, what can we say? It's a great ass story. <laughs> it, it's a touching one. It's a good one, yeah. Moon Slicer. Uh, Grag. Uh, so, yeah. <clears throat> The next one is, uh, I can't promise I'll always do voices for all of them. It depends how the story, like, turns out. Uh, the Grag one just ended up with me doing, uh, I don't know what accent that is. Um, but yeah. Uh, this one is an evil tur, uh, oh, so cry cry. I liked it. Oh, thanks, Pex. Uh, yeah, so this, this next story is an evil campaign turned good. So let's read this one and see what this this one goes to. Uh, also, we've got two stories from the uh, submitted stories to read. It was an ogre accent, nod nod. Ah, I, I, if it was an ogre accent, then awesome. I, I felt it wasn't quite an ogre accent, but... So, evil campaign turned good. My DM and group decided to start an evil campaign. Something I didn't really want to take part in, and in hindsight, should not have joined at all. My character was in a group that contained a barbarian cannibal, a witch that poisoned wells on whims, and a wizard that wanted to take over the world. I was playing a rogue. In our party's downtime, which was spent in a, in a city the wizard wanted to take over, we each did our own thing. The barbarian started an underground arena where he ate the losers, the witch and wizard experimented on slaves, and my character stalked a young girl. That's it. Just making high checks and watching a young girl from a distance. Whatever my intents were, I didn't reveal them, and this made everyone feel what I consider unreasonably uncomfortable. The barbarian, who enjoyed describing the different parts of the humans he ate as supple or juicy, was the first to tell me out of character that I was fucked up. The rest of the group chimed in, but when I reminded them that no one said anything when the witch injected demon blood into a pregnant slave's belly in an attempt to artificially create a half-demon, and ended up just poisoning both the mother and the fetus, they grudgingly qu kept quiet. The DM, as if to dissuade me from my chosen course, had the young girl's life be remarkably uneventful. She woke up, had breakfast, and went to the academy where she studied. After classes, she went home, had dinner, studied some more, and went to sleep. After six months of in-game time, the barbarian had a small group of cannibalistic gladiators as, as his underlings. The witch had successfully started a part demon breeding project, and the wizard had infiltrated the high council of the city and had started secretly administrating a highly addictive drug. My character had learned the young girl's name, knew her favourite foods, saw which students she got along with, and even had a pretty good idea of which boys fancied her. At first, I had thought that the rest of the group was uncomfortable with me stalking the young girl because they thought my character was doing it for sexual purposes. Slowly, I realised it was because over the course of the game sessions, they had all started to care, in their own small ways, about this studious little girl. Though their characters did horrible, unspeakable things to people, those people were all nameless strangers that none of them saw as humans. My character, however, was getting to know his intended victim carefully and diligently, with the rest of the group slowly getting to know her as well. By the time the wizard had full control of the city, his player knew that the little girl wanted to study exotic plants, especially flowers. The academy that he now had complete control over was her favourite place in the world, and her worst fear was if something ever happened to it. The witch had minor demons raping slaves in secret chambers in the sewers, with many of their foul progeny spilling out in the streets above. A few of these chambers were dangerously close to the roads the young girl took to school, though thankfully for her, 
the monsters only came out during the night. The barbarian had been tracked down by a trio of bastards he had spawned many years ago, each of them seeking to kill the father who had abandoned them. After the barbarian had killed and devoured them, in the end the player knew less about his character's own children than he did about the stranger that the party's rogue had decided to stalk. By then, everyone had started to suspect that I had no ill intent towards the girl. I had done nothing to interact with the girl, nothing even remotely involved with her, besides being a stone throw away from her as much as possible. The bar barbarian proposed a theory, in that my character's only intent was to hone his stealth skill during his free time, and that I, being unwilling to actually commit to being evil, had chosen a mildly evil themed approach. I didn't refute this theory. After that moment, the group seemed to actually take an interest in the young girl. From a callous perspective, they were just using her to provide their characters with someone they could be good towards, just to create a deep, greater sense of depravity in the evil they committed. From a kinder perspective, the players were good people at heart and just couldn't be evil to the young girl. The academy was provided with extra funding and a set of greenhouses were built for the exclusive use of the students. The demon blood experiments were now under closer supervision with nightly patrols to help eradicate the escaped specimens. The barbarian, straightforward as, as ever, simply approached the girls gave her a rare plotted, plotted plant, and told her that if she ever wanted anything, she could ask him for it. In the following months, she became sort of a mascot for the group. Though all their methods were evil, they now justified their actions by saying they were for the benefit of this young girl, who they secretly, and not so secretly, doted upon. At first, only the barbarian was on speaking terms with the girl. But after the wizard took an official position as governor of the school, and the witch soon followed after him, they all came to know the girl, more than they had simply through my character's observations. Our campaign was slowly, ever so slowly, shifting in alignment as the players began to question their character's methods. As they grew closer to the young girl, it became harder and harder to conceal their experiments and activities. At first, they only stopped the most obvious ones, but eventually the diehard group, the diehard evil group had shifted to a rather neutral, if not partially good party. Our DM, who loved character arcs and unlikely story progression, praised my character for introducing an element into the story that allowed a group of evil people to redeem themselves. As he described the young girl walking home from the greenhouses, the DM took a moment to also say that he suspected that I had always planned to eventually turn the evil campaign into an ordinary one. Laughing, I told him I never had such an intent, and then I told him how my character silently emerged from the shadows, stalked, stalked towards the girl, and stabbed her in the neck. The end. The plot twist is real! <laughs> Yeah, I, I heard the story before. I'm a very rapid reader of and listener of these D&D stories. Yeah. So I was just waiting for the moment like, I know it's coming. <laughs> I know it's coming. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> oh. All right, guys, I am very quickly going to grab a drink and then we will go through a couple more stories that were submitted by chat in my Discord. Well, don't worry. I can maybe tell a few more stories because I, I got a fuckload of them. <laughs> yep. So, chat. Do you want to hear some more stories while we wait on Shibi? Okay. Oof. Oof, big oof. No. Uh, if you have... If, uh, thank you. If you have other stories, guys, and you don't want to tell them in the voice chat, 
then um, you can type them in the share your stories. And I'll read them out. <sighs> so, how is everyone enjoying the the stream so far? Is this something where you're like, ah, yeah, you know? It's bloody lovely. I, I may not do it, like, weekly. Um, but I, I'd like to make it a regular, semi, semi-regular thing. It's so hard to find good place to hear D&D stories, so mm. I bloody love it. It, it was it was something that's been in my head for a little while, where I was like, you know, so many people enjoy D and D and TTRPG sh games and shows and stuff, but they don't really have a place outside of like you know Reddit and and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, to tell their stories, so I I was like, hey, you know, like I think I'm a decent-ish storyteller, you know, like reading and etc. So... Well, you are GM, so it kind of comes with the job. <laughs> well, that's more imagination than, you know, than, like... But it's still storytelling. Reading. Yeah, 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 I guess. Uh, so, I'll tell you what, guys. How about uh, if any more of you have, uh, like, text stories... Uh, Chuck, uh, if you wanna, if you want me to read out one of your stories, uh, chuck them in the submit, submit your stories. We'll get to them, uh, probably in a moment. Then I'll read the Legend of Old Man Henderson, which is a Call of Cthulhu story that I found. It's a good one. I'm just gonna chime in. It's a good one. Yeah. And it's, and crazy. It, it's, it's reasonably long as well, it looks like. So we'll probably end on that for today. And then we'll do more another time. I'll, I'll probably put this video up on up on YouTube as well, uh, on my channel for you guys to listen to when you like. Um, and don't worry, I'll be back next time as well. Yeah, maybe. And we can uh, we can get everyone in, you know, again to tell their stories and and etc. Next time we uh, we do this. So yeah, uh, sorry, uh, Karis, we won't be able to get any more today. It's fine. But like I'll do more of these uh, streams, so of course you know, you're always welcome to come in and uh, and tell your Of story. course, I was shared in many stories of Beerus, Captain Nolan Venner, <laughs> and a Strixus as well. Strixus, gotta love the Strixus. <laughs> yeah, just a small little pretaste of that. I, I sold someone else's ship. That, that's just a pre-taste of it. Hmm, okay. Interesting. I was not the legal <laughs> owner of that ship at all. Yeah. Uh, hi, been using... I've been using the stream to chill out. I'll be going back to lurking now. Damned man! Perfectly fine. Feel free to, uh, to lurk away. Um, I will get your hat pile. No matter what. Uh, I'll post the full story of my Rogue Trader shenanigans when I get home from work. All right, Radke, uh, I'll probably read them out next next time then. So, okay. So we're going yeah, now. He's a ghost. Uh, we're going now, and we'll do the uh, the submit your story stories. Uh, the first one is Codus. There's no title. Do you have a t do you have a title for the for the first story you posted, Codus? So we get an idea of what we're going into. Save the story of the rat swarm brothel for next time. Sounds good. Sounds good. Oh yeah. Uh, oh boy. That's a good one. The church comes to you. Okay, so this this is uh, um, Karis. I'm gonna jump you out the uh, the. Of course, of course. So uh, see you later, buddy. Yeah, cheers for jumping in and telling the story, yeah. man. Okay, so yeah, the the two messages. I I yeah, there's uh, there's two messages here. I see. Um, so this is uh. Brother Codus's story, The Church Comes to You. 
Before we get into this, I want to be clear that this campaign is not a serious one. It's basically just six friends getting together to have fun doing bullshit in a fantasy world. You'll need a little context. In my D&D campaign's world, there's a pseudo-imperium of man-style human empire on the rise that's made of a coalition of human churches. In typical fancy human fashion, the humans take char in charge of this church are, for the majority, assholes making the church as a uh, whole something the other race, races, nations are. Quite, n uh, sorry, I, yeah. Uh, the humans in charge of this church are, for the majority, assholes making the church as a whole something the other races, nations are quite, <clears throat> quite nervous about. Especially since they have Space Marine-style legions of tireless Warforged soldiers to do their fighting, and the other races don't. So on to the story. My party and I are in an elven city when I and one of my party members are given the task of clearing out shroom addicts who, due to man-made chimeras infesting the surrounding forest, are terrorizing the local ox ranches by sneaking into them at night looking for shrooms and scaring the animals, and damaging the property in the process. So I, a neutral good Warforged Paladin, and my friend, a neutral vampire, get tasked with getting them to stop. Now, while we're coming up with a plan, we get a devious idea to kill two birds with one stone. You see, before we came to this city, our previous stop was a human city ruled by a church, ruled by an archfey that was utilize, utilizing mushrooms from the Feywild to mind control the citizen population. So we decided to paint them in a bad light by having them come, come out to remove competition. To this end we find one of the drug houses and my friend decides to use Major Image to conjure up the image of a new church construct and being the Warhammer fanboy he is, he summons the illusion of a 20-foot tall castigator titan making his way towards the city, burying insignias of the Fey Goddess Church, and burrowing out anti-drug propaganda Liberty Prime style. Needless to say, the druggies all fled the city like rats from a sinking ship, the entire city went into a massive planic, and my friend and I vowed to never mention our involvement in it to anyone admits laughing our asses off. <laughs> well. So to deal with a minor drug problem, you presented them with a massive invasion with a giant titan. Interesting. <laughs> very, very interesting. Okay. Alright, alright. Um, if you want, by the way, guys, when you type out your stories, uh, feel free to give the stories a title and, and everything. Um, if, if you want a title for it, I may ask for, for your titles, etc. That is how you get rid of druggies, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm usually a lurker. Listening to uh, RP stories with chat interaction is actually cool. I love this idea. Even something like Nez Godzilla Creepypasta would be awesome in settings like that. You do provide some respect to a story and freedom to comment. Pizza beer out of 10. Oh, thank you. It, it was just a, you know, random idea I got. I didn't know how well it would do. Uh, yes, it then shapeshifted into the Aquila and flew away, vowing to return if ever her <laughs> drugs coming back. <laughs> Oh, dearie me. Okay. This is a story from Lord Edris Rex. Uh, it is the Chunky Salsa story. I make no promises that this is not a horrific story. No offense, uh, Edris. So, the Chunky Salsa story. My first Shadowrun game, I play a former police decker, Hackerman for our merry band of mercenaries. One session, it's just me and our troll-adept monk. 
Because the other two guys can't make it, we get a job to do recon on some triad guys, and since it's just the two of us, I decide to get a grenade launcher to even our odds if things go wrong. We get out to the beach, where they are bringing cargo ashore, and our troll goes, Hey, you got a grenade launcher, right? Let's just take them by surprise, capture them, and interrogate them. This sounds like a fine idea to me, so the troll sneaks up, and I get a good vantage point and pop a nerve gas grenade at the guys. We alpha strike them and tie the lot up in my van, booby trapping them with a grenade. It was a flashbang, since uh, David, D4V1D, my character, didn't believe in violence. Long story long, things go south from there, and when we get back to the van, next session, there is an awful smell, and when we open the door, this rotted human sludge floods out of the van. What happened? In Shadowrun, when a grenade goes off in a confined space, any excess damage that hits a wall bounces back and deals its damage again. The rule for this is called ch Chunky Salsa, so the stun from the grenade in such a small space did enough to liquefy the guy's insides when they tried to escape. And that is the end of the Chunky Salsa story. <laughs> so, so you killed people with a stun grenade? Wow. I, I guess, I guess your character and his, um, and his pacifism didn't know about the Chunky Salsa. Oh, by the way, guys, if you want to submit, uh, like, TTRPG stories to me, uh, that you'd like me to read out, I can also do that. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to- if, if there's, like, a story you just want me to read, I'm good with that. Okay, so this is- this is a very quick one that was submitted by, uh, Radke. Just gonna read this one out. Alright. Uh, so this sounds like a Death Watch campaign. Uh, let's just read this. So, I encountered a rather interesting and hilarious situation in Death Watch last night. I was running an adventure for my players, a Space Wolf Tactical, a Salamander Devastator, and a Storm Warden Tactical in Scout Armor. The Storm Warden player roleplays an incredi incredibly stereotypical Scottish character, Play carrying around bagpipes and talking in an outrageous accent. His character's name is Dougie McIsaac. Anyway, mild silliness aside, at the end of this adventure, they encounter a Quorn Chaos Lord in Terminator armor who proceeds to fuck the shit out of them. The Space Wolf gets decapitated and has to burn a fate point. Salamander and his had his heavy flamer destroyed and is knocked unconscious. The Chaos Lord charges Dougie, who has his combat knife and bolt pistol out. He swings three times, and Dougie dodges to the side, and the other two miss. Then this happens. I'm not going to do a Scottish accent. I can't do Scottish accents. So, I'm beside him, right? Yeah. Okay, I activate feats of strength, and I lift him. Okay, roll grapple. No, no, no. I lift him. You can't lift Terminator armor. He then shows me the rules, with and and with his unnatural strength times three and toughness times two, he can, in fact, lift three Terminators at once. Uh, alright, I guess you lift him. Now, I caber toss him. Uh, I'll see you later, laddie. He rolls on his strength, getting uh, 9 out of 100, uh, which is 6 degrees of success, strength 60 plus 10 for feet, plus unnatural times 3 for 9 degrees, and then he spends 4 fate points for 13 degrees of success total. The Corn Lord is in full Terminator armor, is fucking tossed 195 meters away, crashing to the ground, and taking 37 wounds with no armor, which is enough to finish him off. Had to end the session after that because no one could breathe properly from laughing too hard. I let him get away with it once, 
but this seems a wee bit broken considered considering a max level marine in power level in power armor could theoretically juggle terminators and that's what happens when parts of your system is a little bit broken the gm has to step in and be like i'm allow this this time because it's funny as fuck but mm. what did i miss in the chat uh it was first time playing had no idea oh so that's that's why you accidentally killed some some npcs with your pacifist character yeah makes sense if you're going for a pacifist, maybe a grenade launcher wasn't the best idea. Ah, it, it didn't have, like, killy grenades, like explosive grenades, I don't think. So, could have worked. Just the, the stun grenade kind of killed them accidentally. Have to go make some tea. Next time, I'll tell the short character creation story of how my character turned from Master Wizard in the making to Happy Go Lucky magic crystal boy from an asexual race stumbles his way into the most bizarre relationship possible. Sounds fun. Can't wait to read it. <laughs> okay. So, uh... Yeah, if you guys want to prep uh, stories for next show, feel free. Uh, I'll just do this. So, I've got a little break in the chat where I can see where I've where I've covered the stories. It was a stun grenade that filled their stun tracks. The excess filled their physical tracks and killed them and turned them into sludge. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Tell us about Gary and the gazebo. I read I read the gazebo the gazebo story like right at the beginning of the show. Okay, so I am now going to finish off this stream with a story of Old Man Henderson. From what I can tell, a few people know about this one already. The Legend of Old Man Henderson is a crazy-ass tale about a player who accidentally figured out how to win, inverted commas, at Call of Cthulhu. Only it was really Trail of Cthulhu. Proof that great times can be had even if bad GMs want to run stupidly brutal grimdark horror campaigns. So, this is the origin of Old Man Henderson. Uh, Waffle House Millionaire says, I hate derailing a thread on accident. Who wants to hear the tale of Old Man Henderson, the character who won Call of Cthulhu? Someone says, I do. All right, then. I'd like to start by saying that the GM was a bastard that had it coming. Bullshit tactics to make everyone go crazy, like a D6 with only five sides... No story, no reason, lose 10 sanity. The others continue to allow this. We were playing a modern day setting. With the other players being a college professor who found out, uh, found a couple of stray pages of a copy of the Necronomicon and wanted to find out just what the hell it was. A detective who was investigating a missing persons case connected to the local cult and a local athlete, I think it was football, trying to find out why some of his friends seem so distant lately. And then, there was Old Man Henderson, who was never given a first name. Old Man Henderson was already a little crazy, and blames his, blamed his life's misfortunes on Vietnam. He never went to Vietnam, he was 12 in 74. And I'll be fucking amazed if anyone gets that reference. Not everyone does. It's the song My Brother-in-Law by Tim Wilson, as far as I can tell. Old Man Hedison wore combat boots. Cargo shorts and an open front Hawaiian shirt with a wife beater underneath. He was dyslexic and had a lesser case of schizophrenia, allowing him to assume that the reason he saw crazy shit was because he was a little bit crazy. He had a grizzly Adam's beard and wore his hair in a mohawk. He never took off his aviator shades for any reason. He had a stuffed parrot on his shoulder named Rupert that he constantly asked for advice, while ignoring the other party members as convenient, assuming they were hallucinations. 
He had an automatic combat shotgun he knew how to use. Also, he had memorized... Oh, this is emphasized. Also, he had memorized the anarchist cookbook. He started the game with a pre-existing hatred of religion, cutlery, and books. His motivation was that he thought that the cult had stole his lawn gnomes, while he had actually donated them to a charity auction, got high, and forgot about it. Most importantly, he had a 320-page backstory that justified everything, from his casual knowledge of physics to his ability to speak Portuguese flawlessly. You can just imagine the sort of shenanigans that character was involved in. The point of having such a long backstory was threefold. One, to ensure the GM would never actually read it, and two, since he would never read it except for in excerpts I pointed out to justify things, I could rewrite and change things around completely at random without anyone noticing, and most importantly, three, convince everyone that I was serious about this character and that it wasn't simply the game-wrecking bullshit that it was. Dickish, yes, but he really did have it coming. First outing of the group, the detective was spying on the building of the cultists with a camera. The jock was parked nearby, waiting for the group to let out so he could snoop it out. The professor had joined the cult to try and gain information. Old Man Henderson very calmly parked his car, got out holding the shotgun in clear view of anyone who happened to be looking, in this case the detective and the jock, strolled up to the front door and kicked it in. While everyone just kind of stopped in shocked silence for a moment, he leveled his shotgun on the lead priest slash cultist guy and yelled, Knuckle damn cult, uh, you damn please keep be keeping my wee men. Did I mention he had a nigh incomprehensible Scottish accent that came and went as he drank and or as amused me? The leader couldn't understand my simple request to return my lawn mo gnomes. Literally, you think what I typed is hard to understand? Imagine it being slurred at you by a drunk Scotsman. He assumed I was trying to cast a spell at him in an elder tongue and summoned a shog off by murdering one of his fellows. One Molotov and about 20 rounds later, the shog off is dead, as is the cult leader, the professor, he made the mistake of trying to make peacemaker mid-murderous rampage, and about 10 assorted cultists. Old Man Henderson then pissed on the Shogoth's corpse, got back into his battered 92 Buick Century, and went home. The whole event was over in about 10 minutes game time, and nobody thought to get the Buick's plates. The building burned down shortly after, along with about half the written plot, and every lead either of the other players, surviving players had. The GM called a break then to figure out how to fix and slash or work around what I just did. It only got crazier from there. Then there's some people commenting, I must have more good sir. Type up, typing up the full exploits of old man Hederson would take too long. Can I just give you the highlight reel? Uh, I'll settle for that. Uh, then there's a list of things that he did. Uh, dropping a yacht onto a penthouse suite owned by Cthulhu cultists. Stealing of said yacht from the cultists of Hastur. The tanker truck incident. And uh, asking which people want to hear about. So, this is Old Man Henderson and the tanker truck incident. Now, time for what we will... Time for what will forever be known as THE Tanker Truck Incident. Notice THE is capitalized. This is because no matter what incidents in the future may involve tanker trucks, this is the definitive one. It started out innocently enough. Old Man Henderson left the stake out in a van outside the evil cult's meeting place to go get some hooch. The only people there left there were the detective and James Fink, the professor's second character. 
Jimmy was gone because it was a school night. Old man Hedison was a bad influence, but damned if he didn't have the kid's best interest at heart. The cultists see me leaving, and I have a very distinct appearance after all. Very useful in scoring TPKs. And discover my friend spying on them. The detective gets a pretty... Gar death scene. I don't know what Gar means. Uh, capitals G-A-R. And James dies like a bitch, but not yet. I'm on my way back, walking along. The detective and James have been brought inside as part of a ritual to give Hasta, Hasta an avatar in our world. He had been banished, and the only way he could come here is via a loophole. He could only use as hosts people who knew he existed and had thwarted him thrice. And then he had to make them drink the lifeblood of their closest friend to make the binding permanent. In case you're wondering, permanent binding equals game over. The first part of the ritual was completed, but before Haster could take control, the detective broke James shackles and he tried to run. He made it as far as the street when the detective, now Haster, caught up with him part demon form. Now, where this church, for lack of a better term, was located, was at the end of the road on a T-shaped intersection. There was a gas station about three blocks away, which is where Old Man Henderson was while this was going down. Old Man Henderson sees the shit, hit the fan, and steals a half-full tanker truck that was refilling the station's holding tank. While I bring the truck up to ramming speed, I toss a 12 pound block of C4 in the passenger seat and rig the detonator to the airbags. Old Man Henderson then took a bracing shot of whiskey, jammed a knife through the gas pedal, and jumped out the truck onto his Heelys. Yes, he modified his combat boot to have Heelys. I swear to god I had not planned this to happen. The Heelys just sounded like something fucking ridiculous and in character. He watched the truck ram the detective into the church, then blow him and all of the cultists to kingdom come. The truck also killed James by running him over. That's when the back trail ignited, fire going all the way back to the gas station and destroying it, continuing my streak of accidentally destroying anything that might lead people back to old man Henderson. I took a moment to call Jimmy. Henderson here figured out what the nasties are weak against. What's that, Mr. Henderson? Point blank annihilation. Click. The end of the the tanker truck incident. The next story uh, is Old Man Henderson and dropping the yacht. Old Man Henderson, with his erstwhile companion Jimmy, the, the jock, and his friends William Brocklaw, a once ha humble bartender, the now dead detectives player, Old Man Henderson burned down his bar on accident and blamed it on the cultists. One bluff check later and he's in the posse. And Simon Breckenridge, the British spy, the professor's player, now six characters in. And yes, they were more, they were all more or less killed by Old Man Henderson. Old Man Henderson had discovered that there was not one cult to the older Elder Gods, but several. This complicated his search for his gnomes and his crusade. He decided to enlist help in making the problem solve itself. Using his contacts, Simon discovered, discovered that an influential cultist of Hastur was coming to town to try and figure out how an avatar to his god was killed. He also located the exact dock on which he would be landing his boat. Jimmy, meanwhile, discovered the home of the head of the local Cthulhu cults was at a penthouse suite downtown. A plan was hatched. Old Man Henderson used all of his cunning to steal a military cargo helicopter. Reed Shurukan the pilot and flew off. Oh, so he walked in, uh, did an uppercut on the pilot, and then just stole the plane. Not much cunning. Uh, and hid it in, a, in an abandoned warehouse. 
Jimmy and Will set up a very expensive surround sound speaker system at the docks, while Simon made and planted a lot of smoke bombs. That night, the yacht pulled in, and we made our move. Right as Simon manoeuvred the helicopter over the docks, we set off the smoke bombs and activated the speakers. On one side, a 50-piece marching band playing God Save the Queen at max volume, and on the other, the audio from the beach scene from Saving Private Ryan. Imagine for a moment what being that on that dock would have been like. Utter fucking chaos. I jumped down from the helicopter onto the boat and rigged it to lift out of there, during the course of which I ran into the cultist guy and ninja kicked him in the head, knocking him tail over tea kettle and off the boat. I later learned that he broke his neck in the fall. Damn convenient, otherwise he might have been able to ID me. We then lifted the boat out of there, switched to out secondary audio on all sides. My heart will go on, Celine Dion. I was in a vengeful mood, gnome stealing bastards. So when the cultists finally got to the smoke to clear their yacht, uh, got to the smoke to clear, their yacht was gone, their leader was dead, and Celine Dion was stuck in their heads. Not the best of days. Then we went across town in a stolen military cargo chopper carrying a 40-foot yacht and parked the helicopter above the penthouse with the yacht about 80 feet above it. Then we cut the line, jumped out with parachutes, and watched the yacht ruin a dinner party while placing bets on whether the military would save the chopper, blow it up, or if it would just hover there until it ran out of fuel. The next story is Old Man Henderson, Hell on Ice. Okie dokie. We were in the end game with zombies and Shoggoths chasing us. I managed to get Jimmy disappeared, so it was Old Man Henderson, Simon and Will going to the final strong point. We had an abandoned hockey stadium. On the way there, we had rammed through a small home and garden store in our truck. And when we arrived, we started barring the doors and windows when I noticed something. Our trip through the store had netted us a passenger, a single lawn gnome. Somehow, I knew right then that this was it. No lucky turn of fate, no deus ex machina, old man Henderson was going to die. But I'd be damned if it wouldn't be the best fucking last stand ever. I then revealed to the GM that Henderson was a world champion figure skater, hockey player, and golfer. The backstory of Doom got one final use. We had almost, we had got almost all the doors barricaded, but the zombie Shoggoth army kicked in the last door and got Simon. Will was po pulled off the Zamboni after he managed to throw the crate onto the ice. The crate full of exploding hockey pucks. Lasted a couple of minutes while blasting Buster Move, young MC, before the situation resolved into totally fucked. I switched to the next track as I yelled, Hasta, Hasta, Hasta! The next track came on. It was the Canadian National Anthem, which Old Man Henderson began to sing proudly at the top of his young lungs. I then threw out three pieces of knowledge that marked Old Man Henderson's blaze of glory. Number one, calling Haster's name three times will summon him, but only if the one who is truest foe at all time, uh, who is the truest foe at the time calls it, brackets, guess who. Number two, when an elder god is summoned from beyond, they suffer a sort of summoning sickness. They're still unbelievably strong, but can be killed forever if you hit them hard enough. Number three. The building had enough explosives wired to make Michael Bay blush. And that, my friends, is the tale of how old man Henderson won Call of Cthulhu. The end. Uh, 
there's a little bit here extra. Um, just wanted to say WHM actually posted a continuation to Old Man Henderson. Shit's whack. Search for Eli Burning. Uh, someone else said uh, he never actually posted more than a quick summary of it. Also, for those of you curious as to whether or not Old Man Henderson was inverted commas real, yes, yes it was. I was there, I was the professor, and like 15 other fucking people. Because Henderson had no concept of collateral damage or inside voice. The whole and complete story was fucking crazy because crazy shit was happening in and out of game, and he only gave you guys a highlights reel. I might end up story timing the whole thing, even though I'm not as eloquent as him. Seriously, I read the backstory of Doom. What he told you about it does not do it justice. Uh, WHM, uh, I guess, is the guy who made Old Man Henderson. Uh, tends to get emotionally attached to a well-made character. To him, they're the means of exploring a story, and a good story is something he thinks the very foundations of modern society are based on. He doesn't mind a bad end, so long as it's legitimate. Botched a role at a bad time? Shit happens. Bad choice in character? Meant to be. Simply screwed by circumstance? Them's the shakes. Lol, you're dead because you actually disagreed with my self-insert fetish fuel character with two katanas? I actually had to stop him from choking the fat bastard. Which might make him sound like a bad person, ruled by petty emotion. But the truth is, he's like a bear, normally quite chill, not that easy to piss off normally. So he doesn't move often, but when he does, things like Henderson happen. It was the fifth session of the game when an experienced, inverted commas, GM using Trail of Cthulhu, a small distinction on the whole but worth mentioning in my eyes, and he'd already lost three characters. To the stupidest shit. Seriously, the last one... Some evil force put a curse on him, and he ended up being killed by a horse, falling out of an aeroplane. Yeah. So the GM goes to grab the pizza, since it was his turn to pay, and I could feel the room cooling slightly. Old Man Henderson's player expression never changed. He never looked at me or the other two guys. I know you're thinking about leaving, but I want you to stay. I want you to watch what I'm going to do. I knew this was bad because while he can get frustrated mad, which is hilarious by the way, he makes a choking noise in the back of his throat like a murloc caught in a trash compactor. When he gets truly pissed, he gets calm. We continue for the evening and about a week later we come back. He's giving me a ride and he looks like he hasn't slept in two days and the stubble is almost but not quite, into gangly half-beard territory. I've done something. I'm not sure it's a good thing yet, he says as he hands me the little binder thing he keeps his character sheets and notes in. You've done something, I ask, as I take the folder from him. I created... No, I created's the wrong term. I, felt like, I feel like it was already there waiting for me to give it life. I put a thing on paper, and I'm bringing it down on that fat fuck like a wrath of God. Uh-huh, I say, as I look at the sheet, is Henderson his first or last name? I don't even fucking know. So then I look at the stack of paper he called a backstory, I start reading it, and I'm immediately fascinated by what can only be called a tome of madness. It switched perspectives and tone wildly. At one point, it's written with stage directions in the form of a script. At one point, it went to German. I know for a fact he only knows like two words in German while I'm kind of fluent. Fluent. The German was in his hand, and it was grammatically flawless. I find my voice. What? Yeah, been asking myself that all fucking day. So we get to the game. And the GM asks what we're all doing. Detective guys drinking alone at his desk, waiting for one of his contacts to get back to him. Jimmy, the jock type, is struggling with maths homework. My character, Professor Filkins, is grading midterms. 
Then we get to the introduction to Henderson. He's sitting in a, little, in a lawn chair in his house, smoking a bong and staring at a wall he painted to look like a Hawaiian beach. You know, Rupert, he addresses the stuffed parrot currently resting on the arm of his chair. You're a good friend. Most people would ask for a hit, but you know how much I love this shit. Way better than what we had back in, now in Nam. He chuckles and then begins reminiscing. You know, I still remember the first time I got high. Back of my older brother's van. No, it must have been some good shit too, because I'm an only child. Ain't that right, Charles? He looks over to an empty corner of the room. Charlie? He then gets up, mildly concerned. Man, what the hell? He begins to search the house in earnest before sitting down on a chair in his kitchen. Where the fuck are my lawn gnomes? I mean, did someone steal them? Who the fuck would steal them? Yeah, they're worth a lot, but come on. He then pulls out a sharpie and begins to scribble on the table. Alright. 215 lawn, uh, lawn gnomes. Total weight about 800 pounds. Total value approaching 40k. Not a one man job. Need, need help to carry them. Help to sell them. I'm looking at a large and well organized group of assholes. He looks into the middle distance. Like those guys down the street. They're Mormons, right? Large religious group. Come around in the early morning, like those damn Charlies. Roops. I think we got a lead. And then he poured a bottle of Jack Daniels in a large go cup and went and got in his car. Before I get back to the rest of the party, it should be noted that Henderson looks a lot like Jeff Bridges of today. So imagine all of his lines in that voice, because that's the voice we were treated to at the table. Anyway. I've had the lead on, on a cult meeting for a while, and I managed to get an invite. I'm sitting in the front row, listening to a passionate Arab man talk about how there's more to the world than we know. Despite myself, I'm intrigued. Jimmy is sitting outside thinking about his friends and trying to decide if he should go in and talk to them or what. The detective's gotten his call back and is now watching the scene with interest. This is like the director's cut, so it's it's the same scene as the first story, except for in a bit more detail, I guess. Uh, from a different perspective. A battered Buick, 92 Buick Century, fails to get their attention until it suddenly executes a perfect handbrake turn and parks at the curb. Back to Henderson's point of view. He's blasting Credence Clearwater Revival when he suddenly sniffs the air and says, Mormons, before whipping around and parking out front and killing the car. He then gets out of the car and pops the trunk. In full view of the detective, he then shoves Lurid Lucy, an inflatable sex toy of ex exceptional quality, to one side and pulls out some sort of Israeli-made combat shotgun and starts walking towards the house. He then kicks open the door while our mouths are agape and shouts the words that let us know the game would never be the same again. Muckle damned cultists, are you Nambies keeping me wee men? So, at this point, the GM has not yet realised what Henderson is. In fact, I think I'm the only one who truly understood what was about to happen to existential horror, as at this point in time... Here's another fun fact about the player. While he's at the game table with a character sheet, you aren't at the table with him. You're at the table with whatever character he's playing until further notice. I don't think he could meta gamed if he tried. So anyway, the GM has decided to regain control the only way he knows how. By killing the player's latest character via bullshit. So he summons a Shoggoth. Henderson, having passed the will check to not puke up his brains, and winning the initiative, comments on how it's the ugliest fucking poodle ever. Oh god. And then shoots it in the fucking face until it dies. Then he shoots the cultist guy who summoned it. Then he shoots me. Then a random guy. Then he pisses on the Shoggoth's corpse, since everyone else is too busy losing their shit in a panic over the creature that should not be summoned and casually sets the tapestry on fire with a cigar as he walks out the door. 
so then everyone that's still alive runs the fuck away from the burning building before the cops show up. Henderson makes it home, about three blocks away, when he realises something horrible. He totally fucking forgot about the lawn gnomes. He runs back to the still burning building, only to see the fire department has already arrived. They inform him that no gnomes were in the building that they can tell. On the one hand, he's relieved as fuck since he didn't lose the gnomes, and killing that many little people would probably constitute a hate crime. Never mind that he just totally leveled a church with the speed and brutality of the fucking Spetsnats. Anyway, he goes to try and cook up where they could have gone at a local pub. The GM at this point looks up at us from his notes. He's clearly been thrown so far off the fucking tracks by what just happened that he can't just improv his way out of it. I... I think I need a minute. Or ten. He amscrays and I look over to the man I thought I knew. His cell phone out and is asking us if we're cool with Chinese food since we had pizza last week. What the fuck was that? Asks one of our fellow players. Remember when I said I was getting revenge? I brought out the big guns. I, I don't even have the small guns anymore. I was given some once and promptly returned them. Won't be needing these, I said. Hello, Chinese food place I forgot the name of. You still got that special on shrimp fried rice? Uh, this is Director's Cut Part 2. Let's see how much... Okay, so it looks like this is the story uh, from the other guy's perspective. Uh, there, there seems to be a lot of this. Do you guys want me to carry on with this? Uh, let's have a look here. Or would you like me to save more of... Uh, would you like me to save this for the next uh, recording stream? Yes, God, yes, we need to know it all. Honestly, lost track while eating my ruffle, fair enough. Varys says yes. Save it for the next stream. Okay. Uh, I think the rest can wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think we've I think we've done a good job here today. Uh, I think we all had a lot of fun. So, speaking as a man who is apparently narrating uh, stories on occasional streams, uh, that was a lot of fun, guys. I really enjoyed that. I think uh, I think this should be a regular thing like reading out stories and just that kind of thing. Uh, I did it today because we don't have Charlie Foxtrot for this week and possibly next week. Uh, hopefully he'll be coming back soon. I will post up the viewer game so you guys have something to watch. Uh, and I'm thinking about a few other ideas for the YouTube channel and like videos I can post for you all. So keep that in mind. Uh, having said that, I hope you enjoyed the stream. If you're watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed the video. This was a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll get people in next time to talk about... Uh, ho hopefully uh, next time we can get people in to talk about their stories. But I'm perfectly happy to read them out and, and all that kind of thing as well. Uh, don't forget to check out things like my Patreon if you want to encourage me to do things uh, or support me. Um, this was a super load of fun. Thanks for watching. Thanks to people who support me and, and, and watch me and everything like that. Uh, we'll do more of these and we'll lock down an actual schedule for Sis for Share Your Stories. Thank you for watching.